to every heart in Jesus' name. I want to remind you that this is a leaders' development meeting. And I really appreciate that you are here with your heart. You are here with your mind. You are not here for any other purpose. When we are praying, we all want to pray. And while I am preaching, I want you to pay attention. I don't appreciate anybody showing wristwatch or doing this and that to limit what we say. You are not here to control the meeting. You are not here to do anything extra. You are here to hear the word of God. And I want to have the liberty to say everything I need to say. If I discover that anybody is here not to learn the word of God and not to follow us as we are going through the word of God, I'll spot you out and I'll send for you later. I will remove you from the working team. Do we understand? Thank you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you, Lord, because you raised us up so that we can reach out to your people, your creatures, and bring them into the kingdom. We're asking, Lord, tonight to speak your word to every heart in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that your spirit will reveal everything we need. And we pray that as you reveal, we'll follow through, we'll be prayerful, and we'll receive everything according to your will in Jesus' name. Be with us, Lord. Speak to every heart. And lead us, Lord, to fulfill your will and your calling for our lives. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody there says, say many again. Thank you very much. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 12, verse 13, and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 12. It says, take each brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Now as you understand that every passage of scripture is meant for everyone because the Lord has given us the word for the whole church. So it is for members. And you heard our teacher teaching tonight. He taught from the perspective of teaching members of the church. But you understand, the same scripture is given not only to members, but to the ministers. It's like you come to the people of Israel, and the manna came down for them. The manna came down for all the members of the commonwealth of Israel. And the manna came down for all the workers, all the levers. The same manna came down for Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And so then, as you look at the passage, there's a way you'll approach the passage if you're talking to sinners. There's a way you'll approach the passage if you're talking to believers. There's a way you'll look at the passage if you're looking at the people who are backsliding and you need to bring them to the Lord. There's a way you're going to look at the passage if you're look, looking at ministers. The ministers who portray the glory of God and they have the word of God to give unto the people. And because we're leaders tonight, that's why we're approaching this passage, these three verses from the perspective of ministers of the word. Look at this again. Take each brethren. We'll be talking to you know people like uh, apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets. And we're saying, take it yourself, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the Lord. Could ministers have any heart of unbelief? Of course, yes. Because the apostles came, the disciples came to Christ. They said, why couldn't we cast him out? And he said, because of your unbelief. 
And then we remember Thomas that said, I will not believe except I see him and then I touch the nail prints of his hand. Ministers may have the evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And then it says, but exhort one another daily. That means uh, we ministers should be talking to each other. I should be talking to you. You should be talking to other people. Brothers talking to brothers and sisters talking to sisters. Lest at any time we who are ministers will have the hardness of heart. And then it says, lest through unbelief we miss what the Lord has given to us. It says in verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. Members of the church are made partakers of Christ. Ministers are made partakers of Christ. And as ministers, we are made partakers of Christ. It says, if we hold fast. That's what um, Paul the Apostle told Timothy, hold fast, what you have got. The ministers have to hold fast. That's what he told the titles. You have to hold fast. It says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. I pray you'll hold on till the end in Jesus' name. Tonight I'm looking at maintaining a consistent ministerial progress towards heaven. The Lord has called us. He called us to salvation. He called us to sanctification. And he called us to service. And now that he has called us, we need to maintain consistent ministerial progress towards heaven. In fact, the whole epistle is challenging us to that. It's saying, others have missed it. Don't miss it. Hold it fast. Your confidence, your conversion, your consecration, and your life, and the calling he has given you. Look at chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. Chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. It says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall, lest any man fall, after the same manner, the same example of unbelief. You see what he's telling us? He's told us in chapter 3, he comes to chapter 4, he says, brethren, Fellow ministers, let us hold fast. Let us labor. Let us endeavor. Let us do everything we need to do. Lest any of us fail after the same example of unbelief. I'm looking at chapter 5 and verse 11. It says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Look at Paul the Apostle, direct. Talking to the people, he said, a lot of things we ought to emphasize, a lot of things we ought to reestablish, a lot of things we ought to teach, a lot of things we ought to reveal, but it's so hard to tell you because you are dull of hearing. Look at verse 12, for when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that won't teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. It's talking about the first principle. What are those first principles? Look at uh, verse uh, 1 of chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go into perfection, not laying again uh, the foundation of repentance from uh, dead works. It says uh, the problem with these people is right into it is that you still have to talk about repentance, repentance all the time. It said that's the foundation. Let's go on building. Let's make progress. And let's leave the foundation of repentance and then of faith toward God, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ so you can be saved. He said, let's get done with that. And then he says of the doctrine of baptisms, that is water baptism and spirit baptism and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of the final judgment. Let's lay that aside and let us go on to perfection. Come back to chapter 5 and verse 12. For when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that won't teach you again. Ye have need that won't teach you again. Look up here for a moment. You see, practice makes perfection. And it is uh, not helping our church, it is not helping our ministry. When we send outlines from the headquarters here to all the churches and all the preachers in a deeper life Bible church, you know what? They are not able to practice to prepare the outline themselves. They are not able to write down things, things now. They are not able to make up an outline. Even in a Lagos at the headquarters here, our people do not know how to prepare themselves 
because we spoon feed everybody every time. But you look at the word of God, you know that this is a subject we are dealing with, and then you prepare an outline. You practice and practice and practice. It makes you to go to your concordance. It makes you to go to other Bible commentaries so that you can have the outline prepared by yourself. And, uh, you know, we have state overseers. We have to still send uh, outlines to them. National overseers, send outlines to them. Region overseers, send outlines to them. Group pastors, send outlines to them. People who have been in the church for 20 years, 30 years, and they have been pastoring for so many years, we're still sending outlines to them. Look at verse 12 again. It says, For when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that won't teach you again, which be the first principle of the doctrine of the oracles of God and are become and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. It's telling us that the church should grow up and we're going to grow up. I said the church should grow up. We're going to grow up. You know, after saying all that I'm saying now, somebody by habit is still going to say it and outline out, but it shouldn't happen. Once we hear something like this over the pulpit, then we understand this is the direction the church ought to go, and this is what you do, and we stop those things that we're doing so that we can move forward, and we don't keep the church in the elementary stage, in the primary stage, and in the preliminary stage all the time. We're moving forward in Jesus' name. Look at verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I pray that we'll grow up in Jesus' name. I'm coming to chapter 6 and I'm reading from verse 7. In verse 7 it says, For the earth will drink it in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which Bear, which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nice unto cursing, whose end is to be burnt. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation through do we speak at thus. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Then in verse 11, and we desire that every one of you, how many of us? Who is included there? You are included there, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Then in verse 12, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I pray you'll inherit the promises in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 35. Chapter 10, verse 35. Here he tells us what we ought to do. He says, cast not away, therefore, your confidence which has great recompense of reward. It says you have come into the ministry and you have confidence in the Lord. You are a partaker of the promises of the Lord. It says hold it fast and cast not away your confidence which has great recompense of reward. For we have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. Our Lord is coming again. I said our Lord is coming again. It's coming for the saints. It's coming for the people who are ready, who are getting ready. And it says, see that shall come, will come, and will not tarry now. The just shall live by unbelief. The just shall live by trying to, how do they do it? By faith. But if any man draw back, the possibility is there. A member may draw back. A minister may draw back. A preacher 
be drawback. A walker, be drawback. A person who has been in the Lord for so many years, like demons, it can draw back. Even Paul, the apostle, he said, I put my body under, lest after preaching to others, I myself become a castaway. That's why it's saying, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But thank God, verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Personal, but I am not of them who draw back unto perdition. You want to say that confidently. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Chapter 12, I'm looking at chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. As you come to the leaders' meeting, you need to look at your own life, look at your ministry, and look at you know, everything you are holding on to. You see, your mind cannot think of two things at the same time. And if something occupies your mind that hinders you from taking in the word of God and from growing, it says, lay that aside. That's why I've been, you know, I made the announcement yesterday. I'm doing that today again. There are people that come to the service. It's like they came for an ulterior purpose. It's like they came just to control the meeting. It's like they came not to receive anything for themselves. It is like, it's like they came so that, you know, they can time this and time this. Introduction, that's enough, Pastor, point one. And before we finish, that's enough, Pastor. It's like they're there to just control. And if you're like that, that's something to lay aside for you to tell yourself hey i'm not here to control the spirit of god i'm not here to control the progress of the of the message i'm here to take something in i'm here to learn and as you learn i pray that the lord himself will make you grow up in jesus name Let's leave all these rudimentary things and let us understand if your pastor is here, if the general superintendent is here, he has enough wisdom, he has enough sense to control the time, his own time. And he has enough sense to say what ought to be said. And everything that ought to be said, the Lord will give me the grace and the strength and the courage to say it in Jesus' name. You don't want you, you don't want your daughter, you know, that got saved through you after I preach the word of God, and then she comes back now and she's controlling what the pastor is saying so that other people will not know what she has known. You don't want your son that you preach to and you preach the word of God line upon line, precept of precept, and then he comes back now after we have led you to salvation, to sanctification, and to consecration. Now you are not allowed to say the same thing to other people who are still coming behind. And you are controlling this and that. That's not the work of God. It's the work of the devil. And I pray that you will not do the work of the devil for him in Jesus' name. Whatever title you told and whatever position you have, you come, when you come before the word of God, you say, Lord, I'm here. Reveal yourself to me and reveal your mind to me. And if you are like that today, you have to lay aside every weight and the things that are setting us back and the things that is not making the ministry strong. You set everything aside and the Lord will bless you. Amen. The Lord will forgive the past and then the Lord will move you on. But... If you don't lay that aside, and then you are here, you are disturbing yourself, you are disturbing me, you are disturbing everybody else, then we might have to remove you like a jigger out of our feet and say bye-bye, because you don't have the might to follow the Lord. I don't want any distraction here, and I pray the Lord will help us with obedience to his word in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the sisters give me amen. amen. God bless you. You know, the, the ladies uh, generally are of uh, a tender heart and they are of the weaker vessel and the sisters are of the weaker vessel and it still is very shocking when uh, a sister of the weaker vessel that shall respect their father in the Lord will stand up there or will be doing something there to disturb the running of the word and the progress of the word. And I pray that that kind of a backsliding spirit that comes to any lady there, the Lord will drive it away from you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
And then we who are men who ought to be strong stand and quit you like men and be strong and have courage. The courage to lead the people of God. If you want to have courage, you must also help your pastor to retain his courage and speak the word of God without fear and without favor. And it will be very shocking for any brother, for any son, my son in the faith, you know, to you know be signifying to me while we're praying or maybe clapping and disturbing or asking some of these uh, you know foolish questions distracting questions at the side the scripture now we come for combined service or we are at uh, the local church and we're asking questions not because we want to gain but because we just want to act funny act unscriptural and we want uh, the church not to continue the question time uh, what kind of art is that all these things we're going to lay aside in jesus name i said we'll lay them aside and uh, you pastors and group pastors you see anybody that is as, you know rising up and asking and you know it's kind of stupid question a kind of unscriptural question a kind of question that is to make us say uh, you know just make the mind of the people in the church go the negative direction you should go there and just pull the mic out of his mouth and say you are for my district you are for my group and you're asking that come and sit down here and it is when we do that like militant soldiers of christ the church will stand where it ought to stand in jesus name i'm waiting for you amen if you agree Look at Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about, with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. You were on. Amen. I said you were on. Amen. And I am still only I'll keep on running. Amen. You will not disturb my running. Amen. You will not hinder my running. Amen. You will not slow down my running. Amen. You will not put a stumbling block before me while I'm running. I'm going to help you to run. And you will help me to run. And we're going to run. We're going to finish the race well in Jesus' name. It says, and let us run with patience, with perseverance, the race that is set before us. But still, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. As I said, I'm talking to you on maintaining consistent ministerial progress towards heaven. Maintaining consistent ministerial progress towards heaven. Three things we're looking at. Number one, personal consecration to abide with the living God. Personal Consecration to abide with the living God. Point number two. Purposeful commitment while admonishing the laity in godliness. The laity, those are the membership of the church. And we have a purposeful commitment. We're admonishing them. We're teaching them. We're instructing them. We're developing them. We're reminding them of the word of truth. And we have a purpose for that. And we're committed to that. Purposeful. And then you set your heart to that. You set your mind to that. And you are purposeful in what you're doing. The Lord has raised you up. And the Lord has equipped you that you preach the word to the people. And exhort them. And train them. And, in, and lead them in the way of righteousness that they ought to go. And you have that purpose that you are going to maintain such a ministry, purposeful commitment, while admonishing the laity, the membership, the church, the assembly in godliness. Point number three, persevering courage. Somebody say, persevering courage. It takes courage for you to stand and for you to do everything the Lord has appointed for you to do. What has he appointed you to do? He has said, go ye and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And he says, if you do that faithfully, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Courage, we must have courage, persevering courage with absolute attachment to the light breaching gospel persevering courage with absolute attachment to the light breaching gospel tell me your number one there 
Tell me, unison, one, two, three, go. Personal consecration to abide what the living God. I'm coming to Hebrews chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 12. It says, take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You see, the heart is the real essential thing. If you're going to get saved, it's through the heart. You believe with your heart that Christ died for you and that he rose again the third day. And if you're going to get sanctified, the heart is to be dealt with. The stony heart is going to be taken away. And if you're going to get the baptism in the Holy Ghost, it's still the heart with the heart you believe. And as you believe, then the work is done. You're getting something from the Lord you have to pray and you believe and it is through the heart and if the heart is a heart of faith a heart of believing a heart that leads upon the Lord then you get what you ought to get but if the heart is the heart of unbelief then you are not able to have what you ought to have that's why you make up your mind personally that's why you decide personally that your heart is going to be the heart where the word of God comes and that word of God is fruitful and the word will bear fruit in your life in Jesus' name. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I'm reading from verses 8 and 9. Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're reading from verses 8 and 9. Here it tells us in verse 8, And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgment so righteous as all this law? which I said before you this day. It was uh, talking about the privileged position of the children of Israel, that they had the word of God, they had the law of God, they had the mind of God revealed unto them. But look at this 9 in verse 9. Only take heed to thyself, personal, only take heed to thyself. You are hearing the word of God. Only take heed to thyself. You have the privilege of knowing and hearing the revelation that comes from heaven. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Which thine eye, and, and that thou, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. And lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. You see that it says, take heed. You are taking heed to yourself so that the word of God you are hearing will bear fruit. Fruit of salvation and fruit of transformation and fruit of a new life and fruit of moving on with the Lord. I pray will bear fruit. Look at verse 23. Take heed unto yourselves. You see, it's something that you have to do. This is something you make a choice to do. There are things to lay aside. There are things to crush. There are things to take away. There are things to crucify. There are things to deny yourself of. And it says, take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and, made, and make you a graven image of the likeness of anything which is uh, which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. There are things the Lord has forbidden. And he says, you must take it yourself. And then he says in verse 24, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. The Lord your God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. I'm coming to chapter 12 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 12, we're looking at verse 30. In verse 30, here is what he's telling us from verse 30, chapter 12. It says, take ye to thyself. You see all over the scriptures, so Old Testament, New Testament, and in the Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, we have read, it says, take ye, take ye to yourself, lest at any time there will be an evil heart of unbelief coming out of you, and then you depart from the living God. Verse 30, here, take ye to thyself that thou be not sneered by following them, that is, by following the sinners, the backsliders, the compromisers all around, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. The Lord says, No, you can't do that. You mustn't do that. You have come to know the truth. You'll abide in the truth. 
You'll abide in the word of God. That thou not, that thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hated have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. But start it too very important. What things soever I command you. What things soever I command you. If we're real children of God, we love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might, it says, then we make his word precious, and we hold fast to his word. And it says, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, that thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. I pray the Lord will give us the strength and the might to obey these words of God in Jesus' name. Now, if we're going to do that, what does that take? We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, I read from verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 24. And it shows us the example of a man of God. And you want to be a man of God, a woman of God. This is the example and this is the pattern to follow. That we take heed to ourselves. That whatever it is, we have this personal decision and personal determination and personal dedication and personal consecration that we're going to do as the Lord himself has commanded us. I'm reading from uh, Hebrews chapter 11, looking at the example of Moses from verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He had the opportunity of being promoted in the world, in Egypt, but he said no. You see, if you are going to really serve the Lord and be acceptable to the Lord, and you are going to do everything the Lord has called you to, there are things coming from the world you have to say no to. There are things coming from your relatives you have to say no to. There are things coming from your village or coming from your tribe you have to say no to. There are things coming from the political, uh, political class that you have to say no to. You have to say, yes, I understand what you mean. I understand what you are offering. I understand you want to promote me. You want to do this for me or that, but if that will conflict with the calling of God upon your life, you say no to them. Look at verse 25. To say rather to suffer affliction. You see there are people today they are not willing to suffer anything any pressure, any persecution and anything, whatever but uh, Moses knew that if he took the way he was taking and if he followed the calling that he was receiving suffering was going to come and I pray that the Lord will give you the right mind the real backbone so that if you are taking your stand on what the Lord has called you to if it will bring persecution or suffering I pray you will stand I said I pray you will stand it will give you the strength and the courage and whatever the pain or the pressure you will be able to stand in Jesus name verse 25 choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season look at verse 26 it says esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he had respect on the recompense of the reward by faith he forsook Egypt by faith he forsook Egypt tell me what follows there tell me out aloud not fearing the wrath of the king. You understand? That was Pharaoh. And Pharaoh had the power that arrogated to himself of even throwing babies into River Nile. Could kill anyone he wanted to kill. And when he told Moses, you will not see my face anymore. He didn't say that with a pleasant voice. He was actually angry with Moses. He said, I told you, you can go and leave your women behind. And leave all the cattle behind. And he said, that's not enough. Okay, don't see my face anymore. But you know, Moses was not intimidated by that. If you're going to snatch people out of the hand of Satan. If you're going to get people out of darkness. If you're going to fulfill your ministry, you must have the same mind that the fear of men, the fear of kings, and the fear of whoever they are will not bother you and will not make you to compromise your stand and compromise the work, the work of God and the calling of God upon your life in Jesus' name. If Moses was able, I am able. 
I said if Moses was able, then I am able. There is no Pharaoh today. There's nobody on earth today that has that power that Pharaoh had that he could just say, you know, take you and throw you into the river, even without any expansion. There's nobody that is as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar today. Nobody as powerful as uh, Herod today. And if those people at that time, if they stood without fear, thank God I can stand. Thank God I will stand. And thank God I must stand. You will stand in Jesus' name. You see, it is fear that makes people not to be strong. You'll be wobbling. You'll be, you know, kind of uh, moving here and there. Today, you're preaching some doctrine. Tomorrow, you cannot preach some doctrine because, you know, somebody is there. Somebody is over there. And if I say this way, say it that way, they're going to be after me. What if they're after you? Let them come after you. There'll be a wall of fire between you and them in Jesus' name. Look at this. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. And for he endured a seeing him who is invisible. I will endure. I said I will endure. You see the time we're living in is a time of compromise and is a time of backsliding. But the Lord is saying that with all the backsliding there are people that will stand and I will be among the number. In Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 24, and we're looking at it from verse, uh, we're reading it from verse 4. Here are the words of Jesus, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that your eternal destiny is not in the hand of any man. Take heed that your consecration, your commitment is not in the hand of any man or any woman. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Not everybody. Thank God I will not be deceived. I said I will not be deceived. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. These are the beginning of sorrows. Look at verse 11. And many false prophets shall Arise, shall rise, and shall deceive, tell me, many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13, but one, two, three, go. He that endures to the end, unto the end, the same shall be saved. You see, if your life is just like, you know, an easy life, and then you are just going, any little thing, any little push that comes, you say, okay, why are you pushing me like that? Because you are preaching repentance. Because you are preaching restitution. Okay, I'm sorry. You are sorry for this. You are sorry for this. You are sorry for that. You are sorry for that. Are you going to stand? But it says iniquity shall abound. And the people that promote iniquity, they will abound. But thank God it says he that shall endure to the end. Are they in the house today? We will endure to the end in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, the, you, you must uh, cancel the habit of, you know, going around and looking on the floor and see if, uh, you know, your ministry on the floor there. Look up and look at people and do not allow the people you are saying to save. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You are supposed to preach the gospel to them. You are afraid of them. And you are afraid you are supposed to develop the leaders and develop the members and you are afraid of them. The people God has sent you to, uh, to teach them the word of God. Uh, you know, you, you are such a coward. You are afraid of them. You are not going to do anything. But it is when you understand that although there be false prophets, although there be challenges, although there be, you know, the heart of unbelief trying to enter into you, but you know that you have a calling and you have to fulfill that calling. In fulfilling that calling, you will not be afraid of the people you are supposed to restore, to bring back from their backsliding or to instruct in the way of righteousness, in the way of holiness.
godliness in the way that leads to heaven. You are a pastor. All the people in your local church, they belong to you. And because they belong to you, you are supposed to teach them the word of God, then you are avoiding them. You are running away from them. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. You are not going to have any ministry. You rise up tonight and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for cringing. I'm sorry for compromising. I'm sorry for looking down, walking about. I see if everybody is going to kill me, going to destroy me. Now I rise up in the arms of faith. I said, I rise up in the arms of faith. And with courage of heart, and then you go forth and declare the word of truth. And people are going to get saved. And people are going to come to the Lord through you in Jesus' name. Look at what you see, verse 13. It says, but he that shall endure unto the end, I will endure to the end. The same, the same shall be saved. It tells us in Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. And I'm reading here from verse 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 20. Here it tells us and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. That's a fearless preacher. That's a courageous preacher. That's a person the determined preacher. That's somebody that knows that their destiny depends on what I preach to them. And their salvation depends on what I preach to them. And their standing firm depends on what I preach to them. Therefore it says... I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you, and I've taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God. When you meet sinners, you emphasize repentance. When you are talking to sinners, you emphasize repentance. And then it's a faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now it says, now I go bound in the Spirit, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But, tell me, but, say it aloud, None of these things move me. He said, many people are telling me, I come to this city, they tell me problems are coming. Conflict, confrontation, and, you know, persecution, pain, whatever. And then Paul, the apostle said, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life, dear unto myself, so that I might finish the cause. My cause with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. God will give you that grace. Will give you that boldness. And you will do what the Lord has called you to do in Jesus' name. Point number two, purposeful commitment while admonishing the laity in godliness. Purposeful commitment. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 3 and we're coming to verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13. It says, but exhort one another daily. But exhort one another daily. When was the last time a fellow minister spoke to you and said, brother, looks like this needs to be corrected in your life. When was the last time your original overseer called you and he said, apart from preaching uh, openly and publicly, brother, I need to talk to you. Sister, I need to talk to you. When was the last time your state overseer called you and said, I need to talk to you about this. You must straighten this in your life. Look at your family, look at your children, look at your daughters, and look at your sons. Look at the way they are in the church, and look at the kind, the kind of example they are, they are living for the people in the church. When was the last time somebody in Lagos here called you, and he said, well, we have, it, we have to talk about something like this, and we need to talk this over. I observe this, I observe this, I observe this. You are too busy, you are not prayerful anymore. I know how you used to pray. What the Lord is telling us is that, we need to help each other and we need to talk to one another. It's not just laughing together every time. It's not just, uh, you know, maybe having pleasantries every time. But it says, exhort one another, rebuke one another, teach one another, instruct one another. It says, but exhort one another. How many times? How often? How often? daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness 
of sin. It says, this is what we have to do. It says, we must exhort. We must exhort. Look at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 23. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11 verse 23. You are in a group. And the other pastors in the group, they see that you don't attend the group meetings um, you know, regularly. And uh, they see you, you just laugh together. They need to even ask you, brother, you're not attending meetings regularly. Because we are forgotten the word of God. Challenge each other. Challenge one another. Instruct one another another rebuke one another go to them in their houses call them on the phone because it says we ought to ex ex exhort each other and it says daily look at acts chapter 11 verse 23 who when he came and had seen the grace of god was glad and exhorted them all exhorted them all you see these uh, ministers who are carrying about uh, you know suspicion i suspect if i you know exhort them if i tell them the truth i know the truth in my mind if i told them they might not like me are you looking for the praise of men are you looking for they like me they don't like me you're looking for how to be obedient to what the lord has called you to do and it says he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they will cleave unto the lord with purpose of heart they will cleave unto the lord i bring that same exhortation to you with purpose of heart cleave to the lord Amen. don't look back don't go back Amen. don't slide back don't drop your conviction don't lower your standard keep it high and keep it as high as you have been given in your personal life let there be self-denial let there be prayer let there be faith in the lord that you are keeping to the lord all the time according to the exhortation of the word of god we're looking at chapter 14 acts of the apostles chapter 14 i'm reading from verse 21 Acts chapter 14 verse 21 and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch listen to this confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue exhorting them to continue that, that's our responsibility that's what we need to do and it says exhorting one another daily and it is when we're doing this and you're exhorting them brother continue brother be firm brother hold fast sister hold fast and do not allow anything to make you go down in your commitment in your consecration in your character and in your life and in your conduct it says in that verse 22 uh, con confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must throw much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. You will enter. But then you understand it says much tribulation. When persecution comes, don't run back. And when uh, whatever it is, a uh, danger, a uh, stares you in the face, don't run back. Make sure that you are standing and do not be intimidated away from uh, the calling that the Lord has given you. First Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 3. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 it says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. That is our exhortation. The exhortation we give to each other, let's be sincere. Let's be honest. Let's be transparent. Let's be truthful. And you know that that's the need of that brother. That's the need of that sister. Be truthful and say this is it so that uh, they will recollect themselves and come back fully to the Lord. Look at verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words when you exhort people don't flatter them and you know because you know when you flatter them you're telling a lie you're telling them they are who they are not but paul the apostle said not at any time we never used any flattering words as you know nor a cloak of covetousness god is witness he says no of me sought we glory nor of men sought we praise, nor of men sought we exaltation, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. 
but were well, gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our neighbor, and a travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you we preach the unto you the gospel of god ye are witnesses and god also how holily i pray you'll be holy yeah. and justly you'll be just yeah. and unblameably you'll be unblameable yeah. we behaved ourselves among you that believe as she know how we exalted and comforted you and charged you and commanded you, every one of you, as a father does his children, that she would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I pray that that same heart will be in every one of us in Jesus' name. And we're coming to Jude. We're talking about exhortation. It says, exhort one another. Exhort one another daily. In the Jude chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you, and to exhort you. As we exhort people, how do we exhort them? What's the purpose of exhorting them? So that they will stand in the truth and stand for the truth and stand by the truth. Look at this. It says, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Look up here for a moment. You know sometimes uh, there is uh, grumbling or maybe complaint or maybe rumors uh, going underground. That particular district, uh, the pastor there is not teaching the word of God and all the members are complaining and they are saying this and they are saying this and then the other people are coming to you. You leave your own district and you are not taking care of your district but you are hearing about this, about this, about that in that other district and instead of going to confront that person, going to exhort him because that's what the Lord has said, you hear something that the standard is going down there, you hear something that they are not upholding the word of God there, you hear something that they are compromising there, adulterers are there, fornicators are there, evil people are there, they leave them in the choir they leave them among uh, the workers they leave them and they're doing whatever they want to do and you'll say well I know there are problems there, those people, the pastor there is weak, the pastor there is not uh, doing the right thing, go and tell him what well, you to just say, uh, you know, rumoring uh, all that about, you will go and tell them, exhort one another, it is that exhortation that the Lord is telling us to do and he's saying that as he see the days approaching that will exhort the people. If a pastor is not doing right, go and exhort them. If a member is not doing right, go and exhort them. If the choir is not doing well, exhort them. Don't you all say, say well, those, those young people, uh, you know, they are free nowadays. They do whatever they want to do. Their singing is not as good as 20, 30 years ago. But uh, you know what can we do? We can do something. It says you exhort them. If you see the standard going down in any area, take it, you know, you're not a pastor. Are you not an overseer? Are you not a teacher of the word of God? Do what you ought to do and the church will come back to where it ought to be in Jesus name. Any area of the church, you know that you know this is not right and this is not right. You will not say, well, it's not my concern. Your father's work is not your concern. Your father's house is not your concern. The standard of Christ who died on the cross for us and he laid down the standard and he said teaching them all that have commanded you. That's not your concern. Are you a child of God then? It must be your concern. That's not my area, not your area. You are in your house and you see a particular room is so dirty and there are insects and cockroaches and everything there. It's not my room. My room is clean. My room is all right. That one is not my concern. Is it your concern? 
tell me, is it your concern? Look at different areas of the church and look at the standard going down there. Look at the standard of holiness going down there. And look at the standard of sanctification. It's going down there and everybody just passes on and they look the other way as if I can do nothing about that. You can do something about that. I said you can do something about that. You know, at home, you, your husband is not uh, preaching according to the word of God. He's just, you know, petting the people and just making people laugh. He has become a comedian. He has become an entertainer over the pulpit. When you get back home, respectfully, you will exhort your husband. Or you see, it's your wife that is not doing the right thing. You'll not just say, well, what can we do? What can we say? Because if we talk now this and that, why don't you talk? Why don't you exhort? That's the exhortation he's saying. He's saying exhorting one another daily. We're going to do it. I said we're going to do it. And as we do it, we're bringing back the standard of the word of God. Why? So as to lead people to the way of heaven. People are not going to slip away from our fingers, from between our fingers and go to hell. They will go to heaven through us in Jesus' name. Jude chapter 1, I'm reading verse 3. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We will do it in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3. We're looking at a verse 13. It tells us in verse 13. But exhort one another daily. While it is called today. Lest any of you be. Tell me. Lest any of you be. Tell me out aloud. Hiding through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, what does deceitfulness of sin and hardness of heart, what does it do? Hardness of heart, what does it do? A lot of things. A lot of things. Let me just show you one or two. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 19 and I'm reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 19, we're reading verse 4. Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 4. Here it tells us in verse 4, it says, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father singular and mother singular, and shall cleave to his wife. How many wives? singular and they twain husband and wife one and two and they twain shall be one flesh wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore God has joined together let not man put asunder that's the word. That's the word. And it's from the very beginning because that's what, what happened when God created Adam and Eve, man and woman. And they were joined together and they too became one. Look at verse 7. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Look at verse 8. And he said, he said unto them, Moses, because of, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Look up here for a moment. You know what hardness of heart does in the church? It silences the Moses in the church. That okay. That's the way they want to go. That's all right. That's not the standard, but that's what they want. That's all right. It will deny you of getting to heaven. It will deny the people who are coming of knowing the real word of God, what you have heard, what you heard 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It will deny the new generation of people that are coming to the church, it will deny them of the truth. Because when the preacher preaches the truth, and he says, from the beginning, this is it. The man, the woman, they're joined together until they do them part. And then people have hardness of heart, and they show that hardness of heart. And once you begin to mention marriage, husband and wife, one, one, the two of them, they become one, then there's a hardness that is, uh, you know, uh, revealing itself. And this one is 
kicking, that one is kicking, and that one is waving there, and that one is showing something there, and that one is saying, stop, stop, that's enough, and that one is clapping there to show that we ought to stop now. When that continues and continues, continues, the unbelief and the hardness of heart will lower the doctrine, will lower the word of God, or if you want, God don't want to lower the word of God, the person preaching, well, you know, will keep on preaching under stress and distress, under conflict and confrontation, and eventually he will die before his time. And then when he's dead, you cry a few days, and then you have somebody there, and the new person that comes in there, you know, he looks at it gently because he understands that the other fellow went before his time because of the hardness of heart, because he was knocking his head against the wall, and for the hardness of heart, he will not lower the standard, therefore he died before his time. I pray it will not happen in our church. But you know, that's the thing that happens when there's hardness of heart. The Moses there, the leader there, the pastor there, the overseer there might uh, lower the standard. It, that maybe that has happened already in some states, in some regions where the preacher says, I don't want trouble, I don't want conflict, I don't want stress or distress, I have hypertension, I don't want to increase my hypertension, I don't want to have stroke and heart failure suddenly. Because of that, they're just it's okay, what Whatever you want to do, there's no discipline and there's no teaching of the word of God. There's no firmness and there's compromise everywhere. And those church members are happy. They said, we won. We got our way. He would have been preaching that except we showed that hardness of heart. But you know, it will change the standard of the word of God that should take you to heaven. I pray it will not happen here. And then look at this, and I say unto you, the Lord Jesus now said, I cancel that hardness of heart, because now you come to the Lord, and when you pray and you consecrate before the Lord, that heart, heart that stony heart, it will take away in Jesus' name. He says, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and marry another, committeth adultery, and he that marrieth her, with which is put away, as committed committed adultery. I pray that the standard of the word will remain in our midst, in our church, in Jesus' name. What was this sadness of heart? What does it do? Let's come back to Hebrews. We're coming back to Hebrews and we're looking at uh, chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 13. It says, uh, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 15, uh, while it is called today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, how be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years, was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? The Lord wanted them to get to the land of Canaan, but the hardness of heart hindered them. They couldn't get there. I pray we'll get there in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. And to whom swear he that he should not, they should not enter into his race, but to them that believe not. So, verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because, because, because of unbelief. Come back to this, chapter 3, verse 13. It says, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Deceitfulness of sin, it actually hardens somebody. A sin deceives them. And uh, it says nothing will happen. There's no judgment. God is merciful. God is loving. And because of that deceit, they go on in evil. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. And we're reading from verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 17. Reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful. Your heart will be telling you there's nothing in that. That's a small sin. That's a small compromise. Eh, that's just a little liberty. They want to just be straight jacket and narrow minded and not do whatever you want to do. Be free. Your mind will be saying, but you know, that might 
is the hardened heart. And it says it is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. And who can know it? I, the Lord, in verse 10, search the heart and try the race, even to give to every man according as his ways, according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doing. Deceitful, deceitfulness of sin. Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 18. Mark chapter 4, we're reading from verse 18. In verse 18, it tells us, in Mark chapter 4, about the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 18, verse 19. And these are they which are sown among sons, such as hear the word, and the cares of this life, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the world and becometh unfruitful. If the deceitfulness of sin is there in our heart, in our life, and then we're just preaching, our preachers are laboring in vain because that deceitfulness of riches or the deceitfulness of sin will not allow the world to bear fruit. I pray the world will bear fruit in our hearts and our lives in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians Chapter 11, uh, sometimes that deceitfulness of sin will come through false prophets, false preachers. And when we say false prophets, false preachers, don't look far away. I'll be so near you there within the fold. It tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. It says there are people, so-called apostles, so-called preachers, so-called leaders, but they're deceitful and they're false. It says, and no marvel in verse 14, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know, there are people that may speak as if, you know, they are preachers of the light to you, of the true gospel to you, but then they add this and add that, that it decreases the power of the word and the seriousness of the word and the conviction of the word. It says those are the people that are transforming themselves as angels of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall Shall be tell me the end will be according to their work and it will not be a laughing matter at that time when judgment comes upon the people that have misled others into evil we come to point number three now persevering courage with absolute attachment to the liberating gospel the gospel we preach is the liberating gospel and the gospel the Lord has given us is the liberating gospel. It will liberate the people who hear from their sins. It will liberate them from bad habits. It will liberate them from bad character. It will liberate them from false doctrine. It will liberate them from every evil sin. It will liberate them from defilement. It will liberate them from uh, covetousness. It will liberate them from the pride of life and from the defilement of life. It is a liberating gospel. A gospel that sets us free. A gospel that makes us free. A gospel that comes to us and it gives us that righteousness of Christ in our heart. The life-breaching gospel. And if you're going to present that life-breaching gospel, preach that life-breaching gospel, proclaim that life-breaching gospel, you must have absolute attachment to that gospel. In your personal life, you're attached to that. In your family, you're attached to that. With your children, boys and girls, men and women, you're attached to that life-breaking gospel. And with your wife, you're attached to that life-breaking gospel. Towards your husband, you're attached to that life-breaking gospel. Absolutely attached to the life-breaching gospel. And then he's going to take courage. Not courage of an evening. Not courage of one day. But a kind of courage that to persevere in. Look at Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. When God called Joshua, if he was going to do the work and was going to finish it to the final end, he needed this courage. And if we're going to finish the work, thank God we're going to finish well. I say, thank God we're going to finish well. 
you need courage in the face of adversity, in the face of persecution, in the face of opposition, and in the face of contradiction. You need courage, persevering courage. And I pray that the Lord will give that courage to everyone in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 1 of Joshua verse 6. It says, be strong, strong in your mind, strong in your heart, and strong in your conviction. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto these people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and tell me, can I hear you there? And very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law that uh, which Moses my servant commanded thee to not from me to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Look at verse 9. Have I not commanded thee be strong and of a good courage? Three times in a few verses that the Lord was calling on Joshua. I've given you a work. I've given you a ministry. I've given you something to do. And if you're going to do it to please me, you'll not look at the face of any man. You'll not look at the face of any woman. You'll not look at the face of any Canaanite. You'll be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. We're going to be strong. Amen. We're going to be courageous. And we're going to hold fast the word that the Lord has given us. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 14. It is courage, persevering courage, continuous courage, prevailing courage. Preeminent courage that comes above every other thing in your life. Verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, we're made partakers and we remain with the Lord. If we hold steadfastly everything the Lord has given us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast. Don't, lose the, don't hold the doctrine with a loose hand. Don't uh, hold your conviction with a loose hand. Don't hold this word of God with a loose hand. In your family, don't jest the word of God away. Among your friends, don't joke with the word of God. And when you are by yourself or your office, don't gamble with the word of God. Hold it fast. It's the most important thing you could have. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promise. Look at verse 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence which has great recompense of reward. I will hold it fast. We're coming to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. I'm reading to you from verse 12. Mark chapter 13. And we're reading from verse 12. Mark chapter 13. Reading from verse 12. It says now. Mark 13. Reading from verse 12. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death. And the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. You see what he's saying there? He's saying there'll be no respect for elderly people. There'll be no respect for fathers and mothers. And there'll be no faithfulness or faithful friendship and faithful fellowship between a people because they'll betray each other and yet in the midst of that look at what it says in verse 13 and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake hated of all men for my name's sake you are not hated because you are committing sin because you are corrupt because you are evil and because you are stealing money from either people or companies or from the church but for righteousness sake and for my name's sake and yet in the midst of it look at what it says but he that shall endure unto the end tell me out aloud the same shall be saved. He wants us to continue in the midst of those challenges that will continue in the word of God. Second Timothy chapter 1. 
2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words. You see how the Bible is saying that over and over, over and over. Hold fast the doctrine of repentance. Hold it fast. Of restitution. Hold it fast. Of redemption. Righteousness in Christ. We hold it fast. You know it is possible to preach for one hour and a half hours and tell stories and join passage to passage and never talk about repentance. You know it's possible to talk about suicide things and devotional things and never talk about righteousness about holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It says tell them the important thing that they have to repent. Tell them the important thing they have to turn away from their sin. Tell them the important thing restitution has to be made. Tell them the important thing we want need to walk honestly and perfectly before the Lord. And it says hold fast that form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus that good thing See, you know, repentance is a good thing. Salvation is a good thing. Holiness and righteousness are the good thing. Sanctification as a definite work of grace is a good thing. Holy God baptism, having power, the power of the Holy Ghost upon our lives, it's a good thing. The teachings of the Word of God, practical teaching that touches the lives of people and turns them away from evil and turns them to righteousness, that is a good thing. And it says, we we'll hold that fast, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. I pray you'll keep that word. Titus chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 7. Titus chapter 1, verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless. A pastor must be blameless. An overseer must be blameless. A leader in the church must be blameless as the steward of God, not self will not so angry, not giving to wine, no striker, not giving to filthy lucre, but a lover of his hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Look at this, verse 9. Holding, how do we hold? Tell me out loud. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Not, uh, you know, chipping some corners away there. And not taking some parts away. That's too serious. I can't say it like that. And that's too direct. I can't say it like that. It says you are holding fast the faithful word as you are being taught. And then he goes on to say that he may by sound doctrine both to exhort, that's the word again, and to convince the gainsayers. I pray God will make us faithful. And the Lord will keep us faithful in Jesus' name. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 13. Revelation chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 13. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 13. Here is telling us. Uh, these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In verse 13. I know thy works. Where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name. You see, in Satan's seat, where the problem is so intense and so terrible, where the persecution is almost unbearable, this minister of God still held fast to the name of the Lord. We are going to hold fast. In whatever place we are, we are going to hold fast. In whatever situation we find ourselves, we're going to hold fast. It says that thou holdest fast and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days, one in Antipas was my faithful matter. Who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Look at verse 25. In verse 25 it says, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Hold fast until when? I said, hold fast until when? That which you have already. The doctrines of the word of God. The one that transforms life. The gospel. The light breaching gospel. The gospel that transforms the lives of people. The gospel that makes people repent. The gospel that makes people seek the face of the Lord. The gospel that makes people abandon their sins and hold on to the Lord wholeheartedly. And there's a change of life. There's salvation. There's conversion. And there's transformation. And they're translated from the kingdom of darkness unto the kingdom kingdom of his dear son that which ye have already hold fast until i come and he that overcometh and keepeth my works until when 
He that overcometh and keepeth my works until when? Until the end. To him will I give power over the nations. I pray that that promise will be yours in Jesus' name. In Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. Here we're reading from verse 10. Second Peter chapter 3. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall, pa shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? If we're preaching the true gospel, it will reflect in our lives. It will reflect in our character. It will reflect in our behavior. There will be godliness, holiness, transparency in our lives. In verse 12, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwellers righteousness wherefore beloved seeing ye look for such things be diligent you'll be diligent i said you'll be determined you'll be focused and you'll have absolute attachment to this liberating gospel be diligent that she may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless and in verse 17 ye therefore beloved see ye know these things before Beware, lest ye also, being led away, with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace, will grow in grace. Will grow in commitment to the Lord. Will grow in righteousness. Will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. And the church of God said, Amen. Let's remind ourselves of what the Lord has been talking to us today concerning maintaining consistent ministerial progress towards heaven. That there should be a personal consecration. Look at verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12. Personal consecration. Take it, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in the parting from the living God. Not only that, number two, there's purposeful commitment. Purposeful commitment. Look at verse 13. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Number three, persevering courage. God will give you that courage. Amen. Verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, I pray the grace of God will be abundantly given to us so that we'll continue consistently until we get to heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We really want to pray Again, let me remind you, we don't want uh, disturbance and distractions during prayer. We want to pray. Can we stand up to pray, brothers and sisters, standing up so we can pray. And take the word of God back to him and say, Lord, here am I. I've heard your word. and I'm going to continue consistently, perseveringly, until I get to that final day. Open your mouth and tell the Lord he has enough grace to give us and he will abundantly give you that grace of God.